Hello everyone, welcome to creation.live. I'm Trey. In this show, ICR scientists gather with subject matter experts, apologists, and other special guests to discuss pressing issues, whether that be ICR's current research, or something new that's come to light in the scientific community, or something else entirely that ultimately impacts how science points to our Creator, the Lord Jesus Christ. We hope that these conversations are encouraging and enlightening in an increasingly chaotic world. Uh, I have with me my co-host, Ivana, uh, and NASA astronaut, Colonel Jeff Williams, and ICR physicist, Dr. Jake Hebert. Thank you all so much for being here. A pleasure. It's great to be here. Uh, it's awesome to be sitting in the presence of an astronaut. Um, I know that as, as a young person, I wanted to be an astronaut. I also wanted to be a cowboy, um, and I couldn't choose, so I didn't do either. But <laughs> I'm curious, how did you get into that line of work? Well, it's a long story, but the short version is uh, after growing up on a dairy farm in northern Wisconsin, I wanted to serve in the military, and I got an opportunity to go to the military academy. Um, to spend time in the Army. But while there, I got exposed to uh, aviation and became inspired and motivated to become a pilot. Uh, also, while I was there, the first Army astronaut was selected, Bob Stewart, in 1978. And uh, I had some mentors there, some pilots that had just come back from Vietnam, and I just grew in my interest in not only flying, but uh, engineering, aeronautical engineering, and experimental test flight. And, and then with his selection, I thought, wow, I, I could be an astronaut. So I set it as a goal then, and then went through uh, my military career, did go to flight school, uh, did get the opportunity to go to graduate school, uh, later got the opportunity to go to test pilot school, worked as a test pilot for a couple of years, and in the meantime, I started applying to NASA, and, uh, and they picked me um, after <laughs> 10 years of application. Wow, 10 years of constant application, and they thought, wow. Uh, if you don't mind me asking, how old were you when you were selected? Let's see, I was, uh, would have been 38. And I think the average age is uh, mid-30s or so. Mm -hmm. What did the process of just being, in, in, being at NASA, what did that look like? What did that training look like? I mean, I know that it's very rigorous, but... Yeah, it's actually a lot of fun, and it's a great work environment. Uh, what I found over now more than 25 years of working with NASA is everybody's focused on the mission. Um, and it's uh, just by virtue of necessity, you know, to safely execute spaceflight. With that focus on mission, everybody's got the same goals and objectives. We, we operate as a team. Uh, uh, so to come into that, in a class of astronauts, you initially go through basic training, what we call it. So, it, and it covers a wide scope of, of things, uh, and uh, it's just a lot of fun. Uh, the, some people think intensity, but it's not that intense. It's it's, it's fun, and you, you you're happy to go to work every morning, and uh, the training is just uh, exposes you to lots of different things. And then you get assigned to your first flight, and then with the crew that you're assigned with, then you get into more focused training. Um, my first flight was on the space shuttle. My subsequent flights were long-duration flights on the space station. That was a little more extensive, uh, not only because you're studying how to safely launch and get there and rendezvous and dock, but also working there for months at a time uh, and doing spacewalks um, and all of the work that we do on the space station. Um, and in the international partnership, having to learn the Russian language because we use both languages on board. So it's, uh, and then you can think about examples of we're up there for a long time. You can't call the electrician or the plumber when something breaks. <laughs> so you got to go through all that kind of training. You can't call the doctor or go to the clinic. Uh, so we go through a lot of medical training and then all the other obvious stuff as well. That's a lot of different mm -hmm. fields to be exposed to. Wow. Um, yeah. Could you tell us what that would have been like as far as you said spacewalk? So. I know when I was a kid, like you were saying, you think of an astronaut and they train, and I always thought you just train to go out to space and then come back, you know? Like that was the, the goal was just to go out to space. So could you describe what a spacewalk is or some of the things that you, you had to do as far sure. as that goes? Sure, uh, I call that the highlight of the entire experience. It's also the mm -hmm. hardest thing that we do, both physically and mentally. Uh, 
you're outside typically for almost six and a half, seven hours, sometimes a little longer. So it's a long day. It takes about six hours to get ready, to get in the suit, get it ready, get the tools ready and before you can go out the door. So it's a long, intense day. Um, and the spacewalk is highly choreographed. So you've spent a lot of time focused on the procedures and uh, it's a, obviously a very challenging environment to work in because you're inside this big pressure suit doing intricate work. You know, it's like uh, threading a needle with uh, ski gloves on, mm -hmm. only they're pressurized. So every motion is you're fighting against the pressure as well. The, my entire career with NASA was focused on the space station. And the space station, which is now bigger than a football field, uh, we assembled it from 1998 to 2011. And I think we're up to 200 and I want to say 50 or 60 or maybe 70 spacewalks in the history of building the space station and currently maintaining mm -hmm. it. So it was highly dependent upon the ability to do spacewalks. So it's a major part of the activity over the years building and now maintaining the space station. And it's, it's like I said, it's the highlight of the entire experience. What does it feel like? Uh, like, I, I'm just curious, <laughs> like being in space, like I know that it's physically demanding, but I guess from a more like soul perspective, like what does that feel like to be outside the, the space station? Uh, well, the way I described that, it, it's, it's one thing, obviously, to be there and look through the window and see the Earth and just float around inside. Um, it's quite another thing to actually put a suit on and go outside. And, you know, just imagine, every once in a while you get a, you get a, a moment, a break, and then you contemplate, what am I doing, you know? <laughs> uh, and where am I at? Yeah. Here I am hanging on the outside of the space station, orbiting the Earth every 90 minutes, going 17,500 miles an hour. Um, and I call it the ultimate skydive. And you're <laughs> weightless, so it doesn't take a lot of, you're not, you're not uh, supporting yourself like we do here on the ground. You're not clinging on the side of a cliff, you know, wearing out your, your, your hands. You, you just, with fingertip touch, hanging onto a handrail, on that moment that you get a break and kind of pushing away from the space station, you see this big orbital outpost and then you see the globe of the Earth as we go. I mean, it's just amazing. Mm -hmm. I've got a quick question, if you don't mind, just from a sort of physics perspective. You know, when you're going around the Earth, you know, you, we say that you're weightless, but you still have weight that's moving you in that circular orbit. And I've just always kind of wondered, does it feel... In a sense, you are falling. Does it feel like you're falling or does it feel like you're floating? I've heard some people, you know, some people get sick, you know. Well, the, the, those that get sick, get sick in the, uh, as soon as you get there or shortly after that, and they're, it's, it's going through an adaptation. Mm -hmm. And everybody, if they suffer some illness, nausea, that kind of thing, it, they get over it within a couple of days usually or definitely within a week. So there is an adaptation there. But no, you are floating. You are floating. When you're inside the space station, you're not looking out a window. You have no sense of motion. You're, you are just, just absolutely floating. And it's true, of course, that we still are under the effects of gravity, um, but we're in orbit. So it's like the arc of a baseball. If you, if you discount the drag of the air, if you could ride on the baseball as you throw it across the arc, you would feel weightless. Uh, you can, anybody, if they, I suppose, buy a ticket, uh, can get it in an airplane and feel a short moment of weightlessness. Um, in fact, we do some training in what we call the vomit comet. Um, <laughs> and you fly an arc. Uh, the pilots fly zero G, and you can um, sustain it for about 20 seconds or so. So it's a very short duration. You get a little bit of a sense of what it might be like when you go over a roller coaster and you feel yourself rise in the seat. And of course, that makes a few people sick too. Uh, but it's just kind of an introduction to the idea, to the concept. Um, but I found that it's really hard to imagine and it's hard to communicate the experience to others too if they haven't had it. It's really hard to imagine what it actually feels like. And then you finally get there and it's like, wow, this is pretty cool. It's <laughs> fascinating and terrifying at the same time. <laughs> well, um, 
I read online that uh, because you can trust everything. Then it must be the true. Internet. Yes. <laughs> well, I actually read that you actually, for at least some time, you held a record uh, for I think being in space for a really long time. My most recent flight was in 2016. It was the uh, fourth flight, and the th- uh, first flight was ten days, and this was the third long duration, roughly six months um, flight. And during that time, <clears throat> I uh, exceeded. Uh, Scott Kelly, who had had the previous record for total time and space. Um, and uh, I, th- I think they say I have 534 days of cumulative time over those four flights. A year later, my, uh, my other astronaut classmate, Peggy Whitson, was extended on orbit and she exceeded my time. So now sometimes people will introduce me as, the, uh, as having the record for among American men. Now, uh, the Russians have a long history in long duration flight. They had space stations bef- while we were going to the moon and then while we were um, uh, flying the space shuttle for years before we started building the space station. Um, we had a, an early space station called Skylab in the 70s uh, and there were three flights to it. Uh, but the Russians have had continuous presence in on some type of space station, particularly from the mid 80s on. So they've got several people, maybe up to 12 or 14 people that have longer uh, cumulative time than I do. Still an exciting That's record long. regardless. Yeah. yeah, oh yeah. Wow. yeah. And sometimes, you know, there's these stories out there that it's all fake or whatnot. And my wife likes to say, if I ever find out that he spent all that time in a studio somewhere, yes. he's in big trouble. <laughs> That's, like I mean, <laughs> that is that is a concept that you hear is like of people who say, you know, the, the moon landing wasn't real or that we haven't been to space. Well, what are your thoughts on that, seeing as your entire job? It, it's, it's, a, it's bizarre. And, you know, people love conspiracies. We all are susceptible to that. Even in the political world nowadays, we start, we get caught up in stories and, and uh, people are realizing they don't know what, they actually don't know what's true anymore. Um, but they, they love uh, conspiracy theories, apparently. And, and of course, that's a, a big one. There was a, in the 70s, there was a, I can't remember the name of it offhand, but there was a movie uh, that basically the, the theme of the movie was the moon landing was fake. So it's been around a long, long time. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and it's really hard to engage uh, in the conversation oftentimes. Because I, I tell people, I tell people, you know, the moon landing in particular. Think of all the tens of thousands of people that were involved in it, in all of the years building up to it, and then executing it, and then even at the time, the Soviet Union, who was our enemy, watching us, um, and other countries watching us. And now, you know, we're sixty years going on later. Um, it would be virtually impossible to keep the secret from that many people for this long a time, it's mu- it would have been much easier just to have gone to the moon. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's a good so perspective. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's great. Um, as you share this, it's, it's hard to really know, but it's, it's great to kind of imagine and hear from your experience as an astronaut. And um, just for us, especially being here at ICR, could you tie in like, what is that like as far as with your faith shaping your career as an astronaut and just the influence, because I can imagine being outside that space station and, you know, I would have never imagined that I'm looking at the Earth that I've been so familiar with and just all of those things that maybe have clicked in your head Yeah, looking at the Earth and realizing from the scriptures, Isaiah and elsewhere, that the Lord uniquely, of course, created everything, but uniquely created the Earth and provisioned it for our habitation. And, uh, and in fact, that was a motivation for a lot of my photography was to capture the phenomena that you could see from off the planet uh, on the planet. And in fact, the planet becomes everybody's primary focal point uh, when you get off. I launched for, for my first time, I think, with a fairly mature uh, Christian faith and understanding um, and uh, trust in the Lord's providence and a sense of calling in life, even as a husband and a father. But uh, that extended to uh, my vocation, serving in the military and then on to NASA. Um, I, and it is amazing how often I get the question and over the years uh, after flying in space about how can I reconcile the two. 
In other words, how can I be a believer and be involved in scientific community, the scientific world? How can I be a believer and be in NASA? There's a, a presumption out there that there's a conflict and that they're mutually, uh, uh, they're not compatible, exclusive, they're mutually exclusive. Um, and that's just a misnomer. One, I'll tell people that there are many believers in the NASA organization. And I would say uh, almost every organization you pick out there, you'll find believers. It's just that uh, in our world, for decades, they haven't had a voice. Um, or if they have a voice, it's, it's, it's not heard, it's not transmitted, it's not communicated. So there's a perception out there. And then, um, but so I'll, I will tell people that it is perfectly compatible with my faith. In fact, I was driven by my faith largely uh, in that vocation. Uh, if you understand the calling of God, God places a, each of us in, in unique time and place and circumstance in life. Um, and, and we are to grow in our understanding and comprehension of that as a calling. Uh, uh, and then when you contemplate the uh, truths uh, and the truth of Scripture of his work in creation, and you see it from that vantage point, it's, there's no conflict at all. So I've, I've had to address that question for many, many years. So I've been motivated to try to study the background, the premise behind the question, the history behind the question. Um, and it goes back to like lots of things in the age of uh, Darwin and, uh, and humanism um, and, and all of that. And uh, going you know, from the late latter part of the uh, 1800s uh, into the 1900s through the 20th century and the 21st century, it's been largely excluded from the public square and the public discourse and replaced with uh, secular philosophies of one type or another. Recently, and I'm probably getting a little bit into the weeds, but uh, <laughs> um, recently I discovered there was a concerted effort in the late 1800s driven by, uh, among others, Thomas Huxley. Uh, and there were a couple of uh, publications uh, motivated uh, in part by him uh, one guy by the name of Draper, another guy by the name of White, and they both wrote books uh, with the, the titles, uh, it purported to be history, and with the uh, titles like The History of the War Between Science and Faith, or Science and Religion, or Science and Christianity, as history documentation, largely uh, discounted in the academic world shortly after the publication, but yeah. accepted in the Public life yeah. in the public, so the public perception has persisted since the late 1800s. Even though academically they were, it was all it was all uh, discounted and uh, fraudulent, uh, but it was a, a very successful propaganda uh, campaign that still manifests itself in public opinion. There's no conflict between science and the Bible. I tell people when I get the question, there was no there was no conflict turmoil or anything that I had struggled, I had to go to to reconcile my vocation, the component of my vocation that was with NASA, working with NASA, working with science, and my faith. It only, it was complemented, it only deepened my faith. The other thing I'll say is, people say, did it change going to space, change your relationship with God? And I say, no, absolutely not. Because we don't get access to God through a relationship uh, by observing creation. It only gives us evidence that he exists. We can know of him, but we can't know him. And it's by the special revelation and the power of the Spirit, the revelation of Jesus Christ found in the Scripture, that we're awakened by the grace of God through the power of the Spirit to come to know him and have a relationship with him. So the, um, it, it didn't impact my relationship with, with God, but it certainly deepened the impact that the Scriptures have on me. Uh, like all many experiences in life for all of us, right? Deep in our faith. Dr. Heber, I would assume that you have a similar experience as far as what Colonel Williams was saying when you're studying science and people might say there is a divide. I just wondered if, from your experience, did you have any additional thoughts to share? Well, uh, I can say that, um, you know, in physics, the subject of evolution almost never comes up unless you're doing something like Big Bang cosmology. Uh, which tells me that it's probably not real science. You know, if it's not if it's if it's not in physics, um, 
you know, that, that's telling you something because physics is the foundation for, you know, pretty much everything. Um, you know, there, and really, uh, there wasn't too much persecution for me personally when I was working on my degrees. I think there was a little bit, um, but, you know, again, physics, if you're just in physics, uh, evolution really doesn't even come up that much, you know? So, you know, in fact, as an undergraduate, the, it wasn't even the sciences that tried to indoctrinate me. It was the people in the liberal, liberal arts. You know, I, you have to take some of those basic liberal arts classes, and uh, I got more indoctrination there than I did in the sciences. Didn't really get any indoctrination in the sciences. Yeah. And I had a very similar experience going through engineering and education. You know, never touched a topic. Yeah, and just to piggyback off something you said, you know, you were talking about how there's a lot of people out there who are Christians and believers, and I think that's true in the sciences as well, but like with NASA, they may not necessarily have a voice. You know, they, they may not be in positions of prominence uh, where they have a big megaphone, but there's lots of them out there. Yeah. So, well, you had mentioned this, uh, so just briefly I'll touch on this. You had mentioned that you took a lot of photos of Earth and, and all of that, and you actually have uh, a book that you put together, uh, The Work of His Hands. Uh, we'll actually have a link in the description below. Um, so uh, can you tell us kind of what prompted your desire to just take all those pictures and put them in a book and share your story. I had learned from my crewmates on my first flight and leading up to that first flight and talking to folks that, especially on a short flight, it happens so fast, it's so intense that you launch, you do your mission, you get back on the ground, um, and, and then you look around and you say, what just happened to me, <laughs> you know? Um, and one of the ways to, uh, to capture the moments and capture the memories is through photography, obviously, and video, but I have a preference for photography because it captures the moment. Video goes by and it's, you know, uh, so there's a lot of value, I think, to photography. So I was motivated for that reason. Uh, but I also, um, stewarding the opportunity, uh, I had a, an acute sense of that, that I was be, being given a unique opportunity and informed by my faith, I saw it as a, a stewardship a unique stewardship um, that I've to, that's not lost on me, and I wanted to be able to uh, uh, to have the material, to capture the material, to be able to uh, bring it back to the ground, and vicariously take people through the experience. Uh, so, and uh, and I never dreamed of doing the book. The book was actually kind of fell on my lap. It was ideas of those uh, that I worked with after I got back from the 2006 flight, my first long flight. Um, and the, the, it's a long story, but the opportunity just kind of fell on my lap, so I agreed to do it and uh, worked on it for about a year, and um, and then you've mentioned the final product. And it's still in print. It, that was 2010. It was published. Uh, it, it's still doing well, and I, I pray still edifying many people out there. Yeah. I mean, the images within are, are fascinating to look at, so... Uh, I, I have been personally appreciative of that work. So, well, um, thank you for sharing some of your, your background with us. Now we're going to get, switch gears a little bit. Uh, this will be, this will be the really fun part of the conversation. <laughs> uh, so I would be remiss if I didn't mention some theories floating around. Uh oh. All right. So. I know where this is going. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So as a NASA astronaut, uh, let's talk about Flat Earth. Um, <laughs> what is your response to the idea that the Earth is a disk? Uh, be as frank as you want to be. I, my answer has uh, gotten to be very simple. Two words. Utter foolishness. Uh, it's kind of funny. I, my last flight, 2016, I was on board. And, and uh, by that time, of course, we were heavily into social media, and I had some help on the ground. I didn't do the post myself directly, but um, but I was posting pictures, and you know I would say little comments with the pictures. That was mostly what I was doing. Uh, but then I, I would get glimpses of uh, comments and stuff once in a while, one way or another, uh, fed up to me or whatnot. And I started seeing a couple instances of uh, references to Flat Earth. And at first I thought it was a joke. I thought it was just satire. Um, it, but then I would see it again and again, and no, it looks, there's somebody out there serious. 
when I got back uh, from that flight, I had the opportunity to do a little bit more research, and yeah, then I found out, yeah, there are a lot of serious people out there. And then I got on the, uh, the, the road doing some speaking. I would be invited to different forums um, to include just general public as well as church environments and whatnot. And I started getting that question in the Q&A time. Um, then I f did a search and found out there's flat earth societies out there, chapters. All over the globe. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <Disc>. yeah. And <laughs> when I, when I would get the question, I, you know, I try to be gracious and I try to, I, I would try to engage with kind of a logical argument or a logical approach. But I, and I think the, there's two in general terms or two camps. There are those that are convicted that that's the way it is. And then there are those that are kind of caught up into it, maybe have some doubts, maybe don't have the convictions, but they're kind of caught up in, in the in the belief system. So for the for the sake of the latter, I would try to engage, you know, in a logical argument. Um, but especially for the other group, I knew that I couldn't engage logically in the debate or in the argument. They were committed to the to the belief. And frankly, I was part of the conspiracy, so I, you know I, I couldn't do it anyway. Anything you said would it, be disregarded, right? right? Yeah. I think my sense is, as I travel around speaking now, this was in 2016, like I said, my sense is it's starting to diminish. So I think it was a movement, and, and all kinds of movements start up, especially on the internet, uh, stimulated by probably a small group of folks and uh, catching the attention of people and they were getting caught up in it. And I think they're, they seem to me, I have no data, but it seems to me that, it, that it's starting to diminish and a lot of people are realizing that you know, they need to move on with kind of the real world. Mm -hmm. Dr. Hebert, did you have anything to share? Well, just a couple of things. You know, uh, my master's thesis, I had to do a computer simulation of a mirage it was like 20 kilometers away. Somebody had actually taken photographs of a hill in Canada. And so I had to see if I could replicate the images. And so I wrote a ray tracing program to do it. But I had to use a spherical geometry. Because, you know, the horizon drops, you know, for, you know as far, you know, it drops as you move out. And so if you don't take that into account, you can't reproduce the picture. And so, uh, you know, right there, that's, an argument that you know the Earth is indeed you know round, and um, uh, yeah, there's there's all there's you know all kinds of arguments you can make. I, I saw a really clever argument for a round world that was uh, hosted by one of our sister ministries, um, involving string on a globe, where you look at the flight times from cities to city, and you know you can the the, the flight time is proportional to the length of the string. You know, the flat earth people, they've got their own map of what they say the earth looks like, and you could figure out what those flight times ought to be on a flat earth. And it doesn't match. It matches a round, a globe, you know, so. They're all in on the conspiracy. Yeah, <laughs> the, the, the airline pilots are too, I guess. But, uh, oh, no. yeah. Now, some people will try to appeal to scripture for that, but, you know, there's only, I can only think of really two verses that, you know, and I think you have to really push them to try to make that argument. Not to mention uh, the experience of life, right. experiences of life. We orbit the Earth 16 times a day, so it looks just like that globe with, that we all studied in school. Yeah. Um, I just flew a few weeks ago. I flew to, to Singapore in, for two weeks. Um, it's a smaller scale part of an orbit. But, yeah. but it's right it, Like I said, <laughs> you can't engage in the argument, and it's... Uh, I, I pray people can get out of that. Thank you for, uh, we, you know, we've had comments. And, and so it, it's just, it's good to get some definitive feedback from someone who's been up there and seen it. You know? Well, you'll get comments after this, too. Oh, yes. I've had, yeah. I've had uh, pastors that get all kinds of criticism after they've had me come speak. Oh, thank you. you. Know, how could you have that guy come speak? Uh, we are prepared. <laughs> we are prepared. Yes, yes. But I, this is a genuine question. Just one last on that topic if we want to move on. So I know that people think there's a flat Earth, but um, so would that be the only planet that they propose as being flat? You know, all the other, like is the moon also flat and the other planets or it's just Earth is flat and everything else is round? 
I've never heard anyone say other planets. I'm not planets. sure, but I think they claim the sun is a, a globe. Because they claim that, you know, I don't know how this is supposed to work, but it's <laughs> supposedly in a track above the earth, the flat earth. And, uh -huh. Yeah. But I mean, I've, okay. the images I've seen where they draw diagrams, I think they're saying it's a globe, but which doesn't make much sense. I could okay. be wrong, but that's the impression okay. I get. I'm just wondering because I've, yeah. I've never heard that, but I didn't know why only earth was flat and, you know, why would you make the difference? But that was just another question I personally had. Well, that's good. Um, so we'll shift gears a little bit as further uh, Thank in, you. into, well, <laughs> this one might also be a little odd, but, but we'll get into it. Uh, we've, we've now, um, the idea of this, this idea of like a multiverse. Okay. So I, I've heard, you know, I, I'm, I'm not a physicist or a theoretical physicist or whatever is needed to conceive of these things, but like something about like a white hole from another universe and our universe being like birthed from that destruction of that universe and that there's many infinite universes. Um, where is that coming from? And I mean, I know I personally don't hold that that is true, but where is that coming from? And what, what do you think about it? What, what, what are your thoughts? It, um, it's invented out of imagination. Um, and I, I haven't engaged in the details of the, of these theories or that, that one in particular. Um, it's relatively new and, and, but my view on that and, and other things too, I mean, you can go back to the history, the evolution, if you will, mm -hmm. of the age of the earth, right? It's gotten older and older and older over, over decades because Science discloses data that says, no, it's not possible and pick a number, you know, two billion. So we got to extend the age out to increase the probability that something could occur. So it, it, still it can't be explained. So now we go and invent something out of our imagination. Well, it may, if this isn't the only universe, is there other universes? All of it boils down to, to the struggle, to the, uh, to the basic human question. Of, of existence. Who am I? It's like that, that artist that ended up committing suicide in one of his paintings he wrote uh, in Latin, who am I, where did I come from, where am I going? Um, that's a basic philosophical question that people have. Mm -hmm. And if you exclude God from the picture as a possibility in the answer, and you have to explain everything without God, then you're left with this kinds of these kinds of things that come out. Like I said, it's it, it, they're products of huge imagination. Yeah. yeah, I mean there is a connection to evolution and the Big Bang. Uh, you know, uh, the Big Bang had a lot of problems with it, so they tacked on this additional theory that they call inflation, where supposedly the universe went through this humongous growth spurt early in its history. And then they later on realized, well, our early ideas about inflation were too simplistic. So now they came that they claim inflation caused the Big Bang. But then they, this idea that, you know, you wouldn't have one Big Bang. You would have infinitely many Big Bangs. You'd have all these other universes. And uh, just two points about that. Uh, one is, first of all, there's zero scientific evidence for that. That is speculation. Um, I don't think you can even call it a scientific theory because how could you prove or disprove it? The other point, however, and I think this is the really important point, is that if you are an atheist and you're trying to convince yourself that there's no God, you need to be aware that the multiverse argument does not work. And, and here's why. Uh, you know, the evolutionists admit that it seems wildly improbable that we would be here as the result of a cosmic accident. So they say, well, you know, if you had infinitely many universes, maybe we'd hit the jackpot we got lucky, we just happen to live in a universe whose laws of physics and chemistry allow life to come from non-life, allow you know, spontaneous generation or evolution, if you will. Um, and so, th so, so they say, oh, we don't need a creator to explain our existence. Well, the argument only works if we actually live in a universe whose laws of physics and chemistry allow life to come from non-life, okay? If we don't live in a universe like that, you're right back where you started, okay? 
So the question is, do we live in a universe whose laws of physics allow life to come from non-life? And the answer, the obvious answer, is apparently not. Because evolutionists have done all these experiments trying to show that life can, can, can come from non-life. They've never been successful. They can't even figure out a hypothetical means uh, for which, for, by which it would happen. So it's like you're right back where you started, okay? Even if you say there are other universes, and even if you say that life could spontaneously arise in those other universes, it does nothing to explain the origin of life in this universe. We still need a creator to explain our existence. And you know, if the multiverse, you know, here's the thing, if the laws of physics and chemistry could explain our existence, you wouldn't even need the multiverse theory, right? You could just say, well, that's the way it is. You know, the laws of physics and chemistry allow life to come from non-life. We can show it with experiment, and that's just the way it is. But that's not the way it is. And there's a huge logical fallacy with trying to claim that the multiverse argument uh, rescues atheism. It doesn't. And uh, you know, if, you're, if you are si telling yourself that you aren't going to have to face God when you die, and you're basing it on that, you need to realize that is a bad, bad argument. Yeah. The answer has been given to us. Yeah. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Yeah, uh, yeah. amen. I didn't initially know much about any of the multiverse. I think I maybe have heard from movies or something. But well, everything you need to know, you can watch by, or learn by watching the Marvel Universe movies. <laughs> yeah, right? I'm not into this, so maybe that's why I'm, I'm missing some things. But it so just, scientific. it sounds like it's, like you guys are saying, it's just another, you know, we're trying to find more answers. We're trying to get another, uh, we have a missing answer here. Well, what about this? You know, it's just yeah, another. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's just interesting. Mm -hmm. I don't know how many people hold to it, how serious it is, but... For me, this is kind of newer to hear that yeah, explanation. The challenge is most people won't be able to talk about it beyond that, and and they only know about it because it's in a headline somewhere. Um, but the uh, and and the ministry that you guys are doing is so important because that and many other examples people are intimidated by. So it has a perceived authority that can't be challenged. Um, but it should be challenged. In, in the, it's a false authority. Um, it, so that's why it's so important uh, uh, for you to be doing what you're doing. Well, I have one last out there question. <laughs> uh, maybe, maybe a little less out there because this one's also been talked about for a really long time. Um, life on other planets or life in space in general. Uh, you know, I've, I've heard multiple things about like, well, there is no life on other planets or out there, or and some people are saying, if there is, if we do find some, that discredits the Bible. And then, then other people will say, well, as long as there's no sentient life out there, then we're okay. I mean, so it, ju it just seems like a back and forth. And and I, I personally, I, I have no real like stake in that. It's like, uh, it just seems kind of out there, but uh, I'm sure working for, for NASA. And I mean, I've also read that, like you know, NASA's monitoring space, like listening in for other life, possibly. So, uh, from from someone who worked at NASA, like, what does that what does that look like? I think it was the '60s. They started listening out there for um, for energy, radio waves, or, or whatnot that would have information content in it. Uh, with that goal, that the SETI program, uh, search for extra uh, terrestrial yeah, yeah, intelligence, uh, intelligence, yeah. 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 Um, and you still read about it. It's popular, actually. So the news will grab things like that every time there's a, even a recent headline. And they'll always say NASA's doing this or the Air Force is doing this, the DOD's doing this or, or whatnot. So that's always out there. It's always been out there. I think it's a product of imagination, uh, largely stimulated by science fiction over the decades. Uh, the, and it goes back to that fundamental question of, uh, the, of the existence of everything. Mm -hmm. We're here. I'm conscious that we're here. So it begs the question, why am I here? Or, or uh, what purpose do I have? If, to answer those questions, if you exclude God out of the, question, uh, out of the equation, out of the possibilities, um, it's an impossible question to ask. And it goes, to the, old, the answer and it boils down to chance over time. Mm -hmm. Well, if I'm here by chance, then certainly somewhere else, or in another universe, back to the previous topic, mm -hmm. certainly by chance something else exists or there's life elsewhere. So, you know, we 
we've got the uh, the history of Martians and Little Green Men. You know, that came out of just Hollywood or, or science fiction stories. But still, people think life out there. It's trying to answer that question. That, But it's going down the wrong path. In the beginning, God created. And he created us in his image, in a, which is hard for people to comprehend. But it includes, the, bearing the image of God includes our self-awareness and consciousness and our ability to communicate and our ability to, to rationally think through things and, and give us all the capabilities to ask those questions. Uh, so understanding and growing and understanding of what it, the implications of bearing the image of the Creator is central to to what we're talking about here. I don't believe there's life anywhere else. God uniquely created life here on Earth and provisioned the Earth for our habitation uh, and provisioned it for our usefulness and then gave us the ability to look it over and to say, huh, what could I do with that? And then maybe go search, dig into the ground or, or wherever and find a resource, a raw material, and then have the capacity to, over time, an effort to take that raw material, mix it with another raw material, and make something useful out of it, make tools. I always pull out my smartphone when I'm talking. I say, you know what the basic element of this thing is? Sand. That's why they call it Silicon Valley, right? Silica. Computer chips, uh, that, that's the basic element. But then you take every other component of that thing that's provisioned in God's creative work, and we've extracted that provision to include, by the way, energy and the ordering of matter, the ordering of energy, and then given us the capacity to, to go find it, extract it, develop it, and that explains all the history of human civilization and the growth of technology. Pyramids were built by humans. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Absolutely. That's, that's it, you know, it is, it's just like pushing the question further out. Because then, then it happens like, you've even heard like aliens put humans here. It's like, well, then where did, where did the aliens come from? But it, again, those are products of imagination yeah. without mm -hmm. absolutely no data or evidence even to suggest it. Well, Danny Faulkner's made a, a good point. You know, he's an astronomer, creation astronomer. He says, look, you know, we've been looking and looking and looking for evidence of life in space, and we haven't found it. The default assumption should be that it doesn't exist. I mean, you, you know, and yet many evolutionists, they go, com they just completely ignore uh, that, and they assume the opposite. And it, it's really coming from an evolutionary belief. You know, like supposedly life evolved here, therefore it must have evolved somewhere else. But I don't think life could have evolved here or anywhere else. You know, so I think I think that's a flawed argument. Thanks for y'all's perspective on that. Of course, we also get questions about that, and sometimes it's kind of hard to answer. I mean, we know the stance is like, hey, no, the answer is no, but why? You know, wh why is it no? Well, we also have uh, a just uh, a couple more questions. You, uh, you know, you. I'm sure know of ICR's mission now, you know, with this continuous environmental tracking, the removing of the idolatrous view of natural selection, where, you know, the environment is what causes creatures to change. Uh, the nature is in charge. Um, and you also worked as an engineer. What are your thoughts on, on, on just that, like, very Darwinian idea of natural selection? Um, is it problematic? Um, Etc. As, as an engineer, as an engineer, it's intuitive that uh, what drives changes in an organism comes from within the organism. Uh, it's not driven by the environment from the outside. I mean, that that's always been intuitive to me. So um, even that the argument still exists of natural selection it kind of puzzles me in a way. My my area of study in graduate school was control systems. You know, where you've got a, a, a logical system, it's a mechanical system, you've got a computer that controls it, you've got sensors um, and, and control laws. And it, there's a lot of parallels with an engineering, let's say an aircraft, a state-of-the-art fly-by-wire aircraft. There's a lot of parallels with that and, and uh, what goes on in, in a cell um, in life. 
uh, particularly when you look at the the DNA and the RNA and the genes and uh, and genes being turned on and off. And uh, I mean, even secular science shows that it comes from within. Uh, so you get stimulation from the outside, temperature change, uh, another kind of you know humidity change, whatever change. It's going to stimulate it um, or suppress genes, and it's going to change the, uh, the the organism, if you will. The organism adapts, but it's all internal. It's all inherent, just like an engineering system. So I applaud the the new emphasis um, uh, here at ICR to look at it from the point of view of an engineering system. Dr. Hebert, anything to add to that? Well, yeah. Uh you know, physics, I mean, is, you know, but there used to be this idea for a long time that biology was simple, you know, because you had this <laughs> idea of a simple cell. And of course, now we're learning that's not the case. It's, uh, and when you look at this stuff going on at, at the fundamental level, it's, it's physics and engineering. It really is. And um, I think I, I agree that this is a good path we're going down. I think, um, and, you know, the, I know there are Christians who disagree, creationists who disagree, but let me just remind them of something. You know, remember, we've got to explain how these organisms can diversify, and you've got a relatively short time in which to do it, 4,500 years since the time of the flood. Okay, do we have time? If you're saying that natural selection is real, do you have time for this random trial and error process to develop these adaptations that are going to fill those environmental niches and do it in just 4,500 years? It makes a lot more sense to say that this is design that's internal to the organism, and these are rapid, specified, targeted changes. You know, they're not random. They're not, they don't look like they were just trial and error. They look like they're, there's something going on in the organism to make it happen. So just the, the time element, I think, should give creationists pause that maybe they need to reconsider this issue of natural selection. And that's a really good point. Um, you know, as you're saying, with, with the time for us, because if we're choosing to say, well, there's a creator, but we're reintroducing natural selection as perhaps a mechanism, yeah. um, then you're, you're kind of falling back on that time problem. It's got to be slow. I mean, yeah, it, natural selection has to be slow. And, in a, and we've only got 4,500 years to explain the diversification of these animals. But if it is happening rapidly, and there's a lot of evidence that it is, that's not a problem for the creationist. But it is if you try to say it's coming from natural selection. Thank you all for sharing all of that. It, it, I know that that's all a lot. We've covered a <laughs> lot of topics. Uh, any closing thoughts from, from either of you all to, to share with our viewers or listeners? Well, I just would encourage uh, the believers out there, and I assume most of the listeners are believers or maybe those on the fence, maybe those struggling with these, these questions, uh, encourage people to continue to, to grow an understanding uh, of these issues and to bring the answers that we've been given in the scriptures back to the table to address some of these questions in terms of science and whatnot that in the past have been largely, largely have excluded consideration of the scriptures because the scriptures have been given to us uh, for that purpose, and there's no reason, there's no rationale to exclude them. That will help, I think, in uh, what we talked about earlier with the what I call the perceived authority of even the word science or scientist, um, uh, because it's an unfounded authority if you actually look under the cover. And also, it's okay to want to work for NASA as a believer. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. We're all placed uniquely in, in, uh, in our vocations in life, and we should have believers in all legitimate, if you will, um, uh, vocations out there. I would just like to thank and commend uh, Colonel Williams for his willingness to, to share in this ministry. You know, a lot of Christians don't want, you know, this is too hot a topic, you know, creation versus evolution. They don't want to talk about it. And I really appreciate the fact that Colonel Williams is not afraid to come on here with us and talk about these issues. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. If you found this helpful, please make sure to like and subscribe and uh, hit that bell to be notified of future episodes. And we'll see you next time on Creation.Live.